We're continuing today to work our way through 1 Corinthians, and today is chapter 7. And already we have touched on, shall we say, some pretty sensitive items that Paul raises in the previous chapters, and today we're going to look at one of the most, if not the most uh, sensitive or challenging chapters in the Bible. All the chapters of the Bible challenges, but this chapter lays down the rules for Christians in their married and their single lives. And he gives us, the Apostle Paul gives us his counsel for this. And in this chapter, his counsel flies hard in the face of our society's current views of what the marriage relationship should be like. So there's 40 verses in this chapter, and we're going to cover it in 30 minutes. So all I can do is virtually bring the highlights out and bring the bullet points, if you like, on the subject. I will headline the issues. But before I begin, I want you to listen very carefully to what I'm going to say right now. This is very important that you hear this. I do not want or wish anyone to be under any form of condemnation or judgment as a result of what I say. If the word of God speaks something into your soul and spirit, then heed it. And if you want to talk to myself or one of the other pastors or the elders here, please feel free to do that after the service or at any, any stage. Marriage is an interesting state. I define marriage this way. I say that marriage is the union for a lifetime of two selfish people. If you don't believe that, About three or four hours after you're married, you'll find out the truth of it. If that's hurtful, if marriage is so hurtful, it's because in, in those words that marriage is a union for a lifetime of two selfish people, lies the whole mystery and the challenge of marriage. If it's so hurtful, why do we bother? So before we get into that, we'll deal into two issues of why marriage. Firstly, family was God's great plan for his creation. If we were complete within ourselves, if we needed nobody else or no other person or thing to reproduce, we would be selfish, we would be insufferable. We would consider ourselves as being God's. But God in his wisdom made us each one dependent upon relationships for family, firstly with him, then with others. It was a brilliant stroke of wisdom when you begin to think about that one issue. We haven't got the right to create on our own. We need to do it with someone else. And he made us dependent upon relationship with others, knowing of our propensity to fail. Think about that. That whole concept, when you really think about it and dig into it, is humongous. Out of that little thought flows all our theology, our psychology, our sociology. All those things follow out of that one thought that life is about relationship. Family is about relationship. In fact, all of our living is about relationship. We are created in the image of a triune God. I'm doing headlines here of this tremendous theology behind all that I'm saying this morning. You need, you know, I might be glossing over it, but there's great truth behind it. We haven't got time for us to go through in depth in this morning, but I'm leaving the headlines for you. 
God is a relational being. A God who lives in relationship with the other two people of the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They live together in a unity which is beyond human comprehension. There's tomes and tomes, libraries written about it. Can we understand it? No, we can't with a human mind. But there's a unity in the Godhead which is beyond our comprehension. A God who lives in such close relationship with other personalities that they, from a human intellectual point of view, are almost inseparable. So in short, let's, let's cut to the chase on the whole thing. God designed us in his likeness for relationship. Right in the beginning of Genesis, let, let us make man in his own image. And interestingly enough, a recent study has come out in the last few weeks, scientific study where the geneticists now believe, fasten your seat belts for this, the geneticists now believe that all of mankind is descended from two people. Think about that. God designed us for relationship. That's why being a hermit is not a very popular idea these days. And just as God's creative power flows from his relationship with the Son and Holy Spirit, so our creative power flows from our relationship with, his, uh, with the husband or wife that we're married to. And that's why God ordains that sexual intimacy should only occur within the marriage relationship. When I was a maturing teenager, all my mother would say about sexual intimacy, I used to love putting her on the, on the spot, she'd say, that's sacred and I don't want to talk about it. That frustrated the heck out of me. It used to baffle me, this sacred thing. Now I understand why God lays down parameters for sexual intimacy. And that's why God loves families, because firstly, they represent the epitome of his creative power here on earth. That's the one power, creative power, God left back with his creation after the fall. And secondly, it's where children can best be nurtured and protected. Now, child abuse is a hot topic in our society, but little of it appears, this is interesting, little of it appears in the nuclear bio biological family. Most of the vicious, violent stuff happens in what is loosely called the extended family. You see, God loves the Christian family, and the penny hasn't dropped out there in the secular world that when you destroy the basis of the family, you, just, you start to eat away at the fabric of society. The marriage relationship is a picture, or it's a shadow, of the relationship between Christ and the church. The church is the Bride of Christ. And now we come into some words in Ephesians chapter 5. Now, the feminists hate this verse. I'm going to read it to you. It's Ephesians 5 verse 22. Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. But the problem is they haven't read the verse before it. Because the verse before it, verse 21, says, submit to one another. And then, then this verse carries on because they don't under, the feminists don't understand the whole concept that Paul is laying out here. He carries on to say in the next nine verses, Husband, husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave his life for it. How about that, husbands? 
you have to be prepared to die for your wife. And a woman, when a woman is loved like that, she will offer submission. Submission of another human being can never be demanded. It can only be given voluntarily. Think about that. We submit our will to Christ because of his love for us. Ephesians 5, 28 and 29. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as the Lord does the church. Tremendous stuff we're teaching today about the depth that's in this word of God. I've now been married for 40 odd years. No emphasis on the odd. I just wish I had understood when I got married what I understand now. I've discovered that love means desiring the highest good of another. It's not about my emotional feelings. It's an act of the will. Desiring the highest good of another. That's the Christian marriage standard. So with these two factors, firstly, that family and was God's great plan of creation, and secondly, the pattern for relationship is that of the Trinity. Let's look at what chapter 7 of 1 Corinthians has to say about marriage. Firstly, marriage and intimacy. I'm going to read a, a fair hunk of this chapter today. I hope you don't mind, but it's the Word of God, and it lays out exactly what we're sharing this morning. 1 Corinthians 7, 1 to 9. Now, Paul says, now concerning the things of which you wrote to me, they'd obviously written him a letter with a whole lot of questions in it. So he starts answering them. He says, it's good for a man not to touch a woman. Nevertheless, because of sexual immorality, let each man have his own wife and let each wife have her own husband. Let the husband render to his wife the affection due to her and likewise also the wife to her husband. Everything's equal. Do you see this, what Paul's teaching here? The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Again, the, the balance that Paul's bringing here is amazing for the age. Good stuff for us to learn in the Me Too age that we're in. Do not deprive one another except with the consent for a time that you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come together again so Satan does not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. But this I say as a, as a concession, not as a commandment. So he's not speaking from God here. For I wish that all men were even as myself. He obviously was unmarried. But each one of us has his own gift from God, one in this manner and another in that. But I say to the unmarried and to the widows, it is good for them to remain even as I am. But if they cannot exercise self-control, let them marry. For it is better to marry than burn with passion. So obviously the Corinthian church, as I said before, had written to Paul with questions on various matters. And he begins now to address these issues. And it begins with intimacy in marriage. And essential as intimacy in marriage is for most, let's remember that it is an earthly arrangement. There's no room, there will be no room or reason for it in heaven. For as Jesus says in Matthew 22 verse 30, for in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like the angels of God in heaven. So we can say that there is no marriage in heaven, as some cynic has remarked, marriage will be reserved for hell. So Paul begins the chapter by saying, verse 1, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. In other words, he's saying it is okay for a person to remain celibate, as, as Paul was. 
why he carries on to say, so you don't indulge in sexual immorality. Interesting word, we'll come to that in a moment or two, what that word means. It is, he says, it is better that you marry so you don't indulge in sexual immorality. Then he finishes the section by saying that in marriage there is no room for headaches where intimacy is concerned. Having said that he was celibate, Paul recognizes that this is a special gift, just as marriage might be for others. So intimacy in marriage. Next he addresses marriage and divorce. Verses 10 to 11. Now to the married I command, yet not I but the Lord. So he's really saying this isn't a concession, this is a commandment from God. A wife is not to depart from her husband, but even if she does depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband, and a husband is not to divorce his wife. You know, we live in a society whose mantra is, above all, please yourself. You are the sole arbiter of what is right and wrong. You please yourself to what is moral and what is not moral. Do what pleases you. So now in this country we have what we call no-fault divorce. Now here's the Christian stance on divorce. I'll try and summarize it, but I want to tell you this morning that this summary is not exhaustive. And I have found in every case that I've been involved in, every case is different, they all have their little, little wrinkles. But I could sum it up by saying this, is that divorce is to be avoided if at all possible. There's a recent study which has come out which has done a, a survey of people who were divorced and they found that 70% of the people who were divorced, and if you're sitting there thinking you'd like to be divorced, just think about this, over 70% of the people who were divorced, if they had their options over again, probably would not recommend that course of action. If two married Christians just can't get along, then I believe that Scripture allows them to separate but not to marry another person. Verse 11. But even if she does depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband, and a husband is not to divorce his wife. However, where infidelity or abuse by one of the parties is present, then I believe that divorce is an option. Repentance and reconciliation is the first option. Divorce is the second. Jesus said in Matthew 19 verse 9, but I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery, and whoever marries her who is divorced commits adultery. Now the Greek word translated sexual immorality is the Greek word pornea. Interesting word that, the, that Paul uses here because it covers a multitude of sins. Pornea literally covers everything from incest through to sodomy and everything in between. That is ground for divorce. But having said that, repentance and reconciliation have a role, if at all possible. Let me add just one comment from a pastoral perspective. It's always saddening for me when I'm called into a, to help in a marriage situation and to help pastorally when one of the spouses has already left the home. You always get called in after the horse is bolted. And it's akin to shutting the stable door after the horse is bolted. Call for help while the family is still intact. Don't leave it until it's too late. So marriage and intimacy, marriage and divorce. And thirdly, marriage and unbelievers. We then carry on verses 12 to 16 in 1 Corinthians. I'm reading this particular passage from the 
from the translation called The Message. Not a very good translation at times, but in this particular thing, it, it, it puts it into modern ling, uh, language that we can follow it through. Paul says, for the rest of you who are in mixed marriages. What he was talking to here is people who were not Christians when they got married. Neither party was Christians, but subsequently, one of them has become a Christian. Keep that in your mind. That's what he's writing to. For the rest of you who are in mixed marriages, Christian married to non-Christian, we have no explicit command from the master. So this is what you must do. If you're a man with a wife who is not a believer, but who, who still wants to live with you, hold on to her. If you're a woman with a husband who is not a believer, but he wants to live with you, hold on to him. The unbelieving husband shares to an extent in the holiness of his wife. I think in the King James it says the unbelieving uh, the, the believing wife sanctifies the unbelieving husband and vice versa. And the unbelieving wife is likewise touched by the holiness of her husband. Otherwise your children would be left out. As it is, they are included in the spiritual purposes of God. On the other hand, if the unbelieving spouse walks out and you've got, you've got to let him or her go, you don't have to hold on desperately. God called us to make the best of it as peacefully as we can. You never know, wife. The way you handle this might bring your husband not only back to you, but to also back to God. You never know, husband. The way you handle this might bring your wife not only back to you, but also to God. So as I said, this passage presupposes that after a marriage, one of the parties becomes a Christian. In 2 Corinthians 6, 6 verse 14, the next letter that Paul writes to the Corinthian church says, Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness, and what communion has light with darkness? That's why as a pastor and as a marriage celebrant, I will marry two Christians, or I will marry two non-Christians but I will not marry one of each. I won't marry a Christian to a non-Christian because in the end, it will not work. But if two Christians, two non-Christians marry, two non-Christians marry, and later one of them becomes a Christian, then that is the way they should remain. The grace of the Christian party should be a positive influence in the home that the other party will be influenced to commit their life to Christ as well. However, if the non-Christian departs, then the Christian is free to remarry if they so desire. And now the last point, and in this last point of the chapter, the rest of the chapter, the rest of the next 20 verses, Paul talks about singleness. And that's the third point. So we've gone, th we've gone through marriage and intimacy, marriage and divorce, marriage and unbelievers. Now we're talking about, lastly, marriage and singleness. Verses 32 to 40. I'll drop this out a bit as we go through. Just see if you can follow me on the, uh, on the PowerPoint. He starts off by saying, but I want you to be without care. He who is unmarried cares for the things of the Lord, how he may please the Lord, but he or she who is married cares about the things of the world, how he may please his wife. There's a difference between a wife and an unmarried woman. And so he goes on, he says, the unmarried woman cares about the things of the Lord, that she may be holy both in body and spirit, but she who is married cares about the things of the world, how she may please her husband. Now we're going to pick it up. A wife is bound by law. A wife is bound by law as long as her husband lives, but if her husband dies, 
she is at liberty to be married to whom she wishes, only in the Lord. This is talking about widows. And she is happy if she remains as she is, according to my judgment. Paul's not saying this is a command. He says this is what he thinks. Because he says, and I think I also have the spirit of the God. He thinks. He's not really sure about this. He doesn't say this is a commandment. This is a, his own viewpoint. You know, I first went out with Jane a couple of times, and I decided it wasn't for me. She was just a new Christian, and so I ceased and desisted. And over the next three years, I watched her, and I watched her grow into a woman of God. I was then 37 years of, old, years of age. I was fairly ancient as a single person. But I was a very practical accountant. So I sat down one night and I made a list of the top 10 possible candidates as a wife. <laughs> one to 10. So I decided being a very practical person, I'll start with number one. That's the way you, what, that you do it. So I, I knocked on number one's door and very pragmatically said, OK, let's see if we can get this thing together. I'll give it six weeks. And six weeks later, I got engaged. And the rest, as you say, is history. I've often wondered if I should have pers persevered with the relationship when I was 34. Jane says no. Why? Because those three years were foundations in her relationship with God. She spent those exactly as we've just been sharing this morning as Paul lays out. And, you know, verse 34 says, The unmarried woman cares about the things of the Lord that she may be holy both in body and in spirit. So this is the message for those of you this morning here who are single. Enjoy your singularity. Use it as a time to serve God and build your relationship with him. And as you do that, you'll be surprised what God has got in store for you. You know, when you're single, you're in a hurry. God, where are you? It's time I got married. You know, I... I, I I've never said this before publicly, but I remember when I was 28, I got so frustrated with God, I said to God, I'm never going to pray about getting a wife again. That's it. You know my need and that's it. I'm not going to waste my breath. So he kept me waiting another 10 years to teach me a little bit of patience. I've always been in a hurry. But thank God I waited. Be content. Whatever it is. Verse 27. Are you bound to a wife? Do not seek to be loosed. Are you loosed from a wife? Do not seek a wife. And this chapter finishes with advice to widows, verses 39 and 40. A wife is bound by law as long as her husband lives. But if her husband dies, she's at liberty to be married to whom she wishes, only in the Lord. But she is happy if she, if she remains as she is, according to my judgment. And I think I also have the Spirit of God. Again, he's not saying this is a commandment. He's thinking... This is what he thinks things should be in himself. Now, we've gone through a tremendous lot this morning. In 30 minutes, we've covered 40 verses of pretty detailed advice from God. Well, from Paul, speaking under the inspiration of the Spirit. And I hope this has all helped you get a, a better understanding on marriage and singleness. It's a funny thing. I always say that the thing that we desire the most in life always causes us the most pain. 
And marriage is a union where we have to try and see the, as I said before, it's the relationship of two selfish people. And I, in marriage, I have to learn to deal with my selfishness. And when you are single, you want to be loved. But love is not about wanting love. Love is about giving love. And it's in the giving of love that we get the best response or we get the ability to live as God wants us to live. So I'm going to close right now. I want to pray for two groups of people. I want to pray for those who are married. And I want to pray for those who are single. Because God has got a plan and a purpose for all of you. And if you're married, he wants to really touch your lives in a special way. Why don't you go home and talk about this today as to what we've shared. So let's just bow our heads in an attitude of prayer. And for those that are married and you'd like to do this, this, this is just a moment between you and God. I just want to, you to hold your spouse's hand and I want you to stand because I want to pray God's blessing on you. We want strong marriages. So if you'd like that, you'd like a blessing on that, just where you, where you sit, just do that. Just stand where you are now, and I'm going to pray for you. Bless you. Bless you. Just do that just where you are. Just keep an attitude of prayer. This is a moment for those, only for those who really feel like doing so. Just where you, where you are. I want to pray for you now. God, I thank you for those that are standing here now. God, over many years they have been together. Father, through the good times, through the challenges. But God, we look forward that by your word operating in the relationship, in the marriage, that you would bring a blessing on their marriage that they've never known before. Father, may they sense and know your spirit being upon them, that their latter years will be greater than all their former. Father, let your blessing be upon them in a very special way. And Father, may they sense and know in their spirit your love for each other, your love working between each other in a way they've never known it before. Father, may your blessing be upon them, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Just keep an attitude of prayer. Now I want to pray for those who are single. You only, if, if you're feeling in God this, I just want to bless you in the state that you are. God wants to reaffirm his blessing on your life. Just you stand where you are. Just as an attitude of prayer everywhere. This is just a moment. Bless you. Any others? Just stand where you are. Bless you. God's got a word for you this, all, this morning. God says, I see your heart. In the quietness of the night, I've heard your prayer. And God is saying to you this morning, I am here to bring a blessing on your life and make your life fruitful as you are. And through your ability to give love to others, God says, I'm going to cause a harvest to come out of your life that you'll never believe. And so, Father, I just pray your blessing upon those that are standing this morning. God, you know the heartache often of being single. But, Father, I pray that you would pour your love into their lives in a very special way, that they might rejoice in their relationship with you in such a way that they've never felt it before. Father, I just pray that by your Spirit, you'd wrap your arms around each one of them and hold them right now by your Spirit that they might know and encounter your presence in a very special way. Father, may your blessing be upon them in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated.